Our first speaker tonight will be Dr. Michael Hart. Dr. Hart received his bachelor's degree from St. Lawrence University and his PhD in neuroscience right here at Penn. Uh, after completing his postdoctoral training at Columbia University, Dr. Hart returned to Penn and became the principal investigator of the Hart Lab earlier this year. His lab studies the genetic basis of behavior using the C. elegans worm with a specific focus on the role of autism associated genes in neuronal and behavioral plasticity. To this end, Dr. Hart is also a member of the Autism Spectrum Program of Excellence here at the Perlman School of Medicine. And we're extremely excited to have Dr. Hart with us tonight to present his talk entitled, How Does Stress Change Neurons and Behavior? Lessons from a Worm. So without any further ado, Dr. Hart, thank you again for joining us and the virtual floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Evan. Um, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us for this uh, lecture series. And um, as a former neuroscience graduate student, I just uh, wanna thank the organizers and the students who put this together. Um, one, for putting it together and two, for inviting me to participate. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about how stress impacts neurons and behavior, um, perhaps uh, using a surprising model organism. Um, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, I just wanted to describe uh, what a neuron is. So these are cells within the brain that are electrically excitable and communicate to each other through specialized connections or junctions called synapses. So here two neurons can communicate with one another at one of these uh, synapses. Um, a circuit is just a collection of multiple neurons that are connected via these synapses. So here you could see a small number of neurons that are all connected and uh, talk to each other through these synapses. Um, and then behavior, uh, the very simple uh, definition is any response of an organism to a stimulus or the environment. Um, and in many cases, a behavioral response is the output of a circuit made up of neurons connected by synapses. Um, so in this case, maybe this neuron and circuit controls uh, moving our finger. And so if your uh, finger is pricked by a needle, you might move that finger uh, away from the needle. Um, and so as a cellular neuroscientist, uh, I'm interested in studying um, how behaviors are generated, but at each level from neurons to synapses and circuits uh, and behavior. And uh, doing this, we use uh, genetic uh, tools and a genetic model organism. And for the purposes of today's talk, we'll be discussing how stress impacts each of these levels in the nervous system. Um, and you can imagine trying, uh, as Evan alluded to, trying to study this in the human brain, which has 90 billion neurons, uh, would be quite difficult. So trying to find a single neuron that's impacted by stress or even a small number of neurons uh, that are impacted by stress and how those may change their connections and change behavior is a pretty daunting task. So my lab uses the uh, a model organism that has just 302 neurons. So obviously incredibly uh, much simpler compared to the human brain. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna frame the talk in, in, the, in two questions today. So one, how does uh, stress change neurons? And then the second, how does stress change behavior? And then I'm also gonna discuss how we're trying to connect these two uh, using a number of different techniques. So the organism, uh, as Evan uh, introduced, is C. elegans. Um, so just a quick intro on what C. elegans are. It's, uh, they're a small nematode or worm. They're about a millimeter long, um, which is about the thickness of a credit card. So just barely visible to the, the naked eye. Um, they eat bacteria, and in the lab, uh, you can see here uh, about a, uh, hundreds of worms on a Petri dish, and this is a circle of bacteria. So you can imagine in, in the lab that there's very few stressors. They're at the right temperature. There's lots of food, so they're pretty happy. Um, in the real world, uh, these animals eat bacteria that's decomposing rotting fruit or vegetables, for example. So here, these rotten apples have bacteria that the worms may eat and reproduce on. Um, and you can imagine that in this real environment, there may be many stressors such as extreme temperatures or exposure to ultraviolet light. Um, the worms uh, develop from an egg to adults in about four days. Um, and uh, the adults then live for about two to three weeks. Each adult can uh, produce up to uh, 300 eggs. So you can imagine that we can very quickly go from a single worm to hundreds to thousands of worms, which makes doing experiments in this animal very quick and very cheap. Um, but this is a neuroscience talk, a neuroscience talk. So uh, let me get back to the neurons. So as I mentioned, there are 302 neurons um, and uh, very extensive work uh, decades ago, uh, put together a connectome for all of the neurons in C. elegans. 
And what that means is we know all of the neurons, all of the neurons have uh, three letter names, which I'll show uh, a few examples of. And we also know every connection that's made between these neurons under normal conditions. And so this is a huge powerful tool for us to understand um, how neurons are connected and how they change those connections. Um, so what is stress in a worm? Um, as I alluded to earlier in the, in the real world, uh, there are a few things that can harm or damage worms, uh, such as extreme temperatures or ultraviolet light. And so these stressors um, uh, can impact the cells that uh, make up the worm. Um, there are also some more relatable stressors that have been studied, uh, lack, lack of food or deprivation of sleep. Um, and a, a lot of these different stressors have been studied in uh, a number of labs uh, that use C. elegans. And uh, a number of things have been found, including that a lot of the stress signaling pathways that neurons use in response to the stress or that are modified by the stress uh, are shared between humans, vertebrates, and C. elegans. And so uh, to start with the first question, how does stress change behavior? I first have to introduce how we measure behavior in the worm. Um, and in our lab, we use a, a device called the Worm Motel that was developed by Chris Fang Yen's lab in Penn Bioengineering. Um, and what this is, this is a small chip uh, that has 48 wells. In each of these wells, you can put a single worm. So each uh, well is essentially a, a room for an individual worm, hence the name Worm Motel. And so we can take these chips and put them into a specialized camera box that allows us to take pictures or videos of this chip and each of the worms. And by recording for days, uh, hours to days, we can then assess behavior, including activity. So here you can see a, a worm moving around on one of these worm motel uh, rooms. And using this system, we can actually apply different conditions, including different stressors, and see how the worms react and change their behavior. For the purposes of today's talk, I'm gonna mostly focus on lack of food. And then at the end, I'll summarize some of our other work using other stressors. Um, so using these worm motels, what we can do is take uh, young adult worms that have grown up pretty happy uh, eating lots of bacteria and then take them and either move them to a, a worm motel uh, room that has food or one that has no food, which is a, a stressor for these animals. And then we can assess their behavior. So we, uh, for, for this talk, we'll um, look at eight hours of recording after they've been switched to these conditions. So uh, a normal worm, as I showed before, uh, kind of moves around a little bit. It's pretty happy. It's slowly eating food. You can see it's moving its, its head and moving back and forth, uh, happily eating away. But the worms that don't have food uh, are not as happy. And as you can see, this worm is kind of going bonkers and kind of bouncing off the walls uh, with a, a, a huge increase in its activity. Um, and so this is just a video of one worm, but we want to measure this in many worms. So uh, what we do is put these on graphs. And so this is uh, more than 20 worms uh, that are on food over about eight hours. So you can see on food, they have sort of this nice stable baseline of how much they move. But when the, wor the worms that are uh, not on food here in gray show a huge increase in activity, two to three times that of worms on food. And this is a sustained increase over eight hours. Um, and so these worms are really changing their behavior in response to this stress. Um, and while this may seem simple, um, it actually involves at least uh, three steps, probably more. First, the worms have to notice that there's no food. Then they have to say, oh, maybe the food is you know, next to me and I just have to move over a little bit. And then they have to change their behavioral state to begin sort of an exhaustive search for food um, you know, over these eight hours. Um, so what I've shown you now is a, a behavioral response uh, to a stress of having no food for a number of hours. And worms continuously eat. So um, even though a few hours without food to us may seem uh, not like a huge stress, to, to the worms it, it might actually be. Um, and as a genetics lab, we're very interested in trying to understand what genes control this behavioral stress response. Um, and just to give a quick crash course in genetics, all of our cells have chromosomes that are made up of DNA. Within these stretches of DNA are many different genes. Um, and these genes make different proteins um, that do different things in cells. Uh, our lab, uh, which may not be surprising, is very interested in genes and proteins that are in neurons and specifically at synapses. Um, and one of our favorite genes is norexin, which is both in neurons and at synapses. In humans, it's encoded by the uh, gene NRXN1. Uh, and this is just the protein domain structure. Um, and then this is where it is localized at a synapse spreading from uh, or connecting from one neuron across the synapse and getting close to touching uh, the neuron that it's communicating with. 
Um, in addition to this just being a fascinating uh, gene and protein in terms of uh, basic neuroscience, this gene is also associated, associated uh, as a risk factor for many different brain disorders. Um, some you may recognize autism or Tourette syndrome. Um, and so worms actually have a very similar gene, NRX1, um, and it, it makes a protein in worms that's essentially at the domain level identical to the human uh, protein. And it's also located in neurons and at synapses. And to study it, what we do is we actually take worms and delete this gene. So we have worms that lack this gene and lack this protein. And then we can see what that does to behavior. So going back to our behavioral stress response, um, where the worms are hyperactive in the conditions of no food, we can now do this uh, with worms that lack norexin. So this is indicated by these orange cartoon worms or the fact that this is a lowercase NRX1 italic. So these worms do not have norexin and these are the control worms that do. And so when we look at the activity of these uh, norex uh, worms without norexin, what we find is that generally they look very normal when they're on stress. So like the control worms with norexin, they move around a little bit, they're eating, they're pretty happy. Um, when they're off of food, we were curious what might happen. And what we thought we saw just looking at these, you know, sample videos was that um, while the, the worms without norexin began to move a bit more, it wasn't necessarily as hyperactive as the worms with norexin. And again, that's just one worm, and we wanted to measure this in lots of different worms to get a good feel for it. Um, and what you can see here is that uh, the orange line here are worms without norexin um, that are off of food. And you can see that they're nowhere near responding in the same way as the worms that have norexin. So this indicates that norexin is required for this behavioral response to this stress. Um, and so now we can say that norexin uh, is a gene that controls this behavioral response to stress. And now work in the lab is trying to understand where within the nervous system or where within the, the worm, this gene and protein are functioning to control this stress response. Um, and that's ongoing work uh, that hopefully we'll have updates on soon. Um, now switching gears just a little bit, um, I'm turning to the second question. How do we uh, study stress uh, and how it affects neurons? Um, and so to measure uh, neurons in the worm, uh, we, I'll use uh, one of our favorite neurons as an example, the DVB neuron, which is in the tail of the worm here, just shown in a cartoon uh, worm. Uh, but what it looks like in real life is this. So if this gray outline is the tail of a worm. This red blob is the DVB cell body of the neuron. Um, and you may see a little bit here, but it's probably a little hard to see. So this is the same picture, uh, but instead of red, I've turned it black. Uh, so hopefully it'll be easier to see on your screen. So this is the neuron and it sends a neurite or an extension um, back to here and then forward into the worm. And so uh, what you can't see in this uh, is that there's actually lots of neurons surrounding this cell body and this extension that this neuron is connecting to. Um, but the power of the worm is that we can actually look specifically at this neuron and see what happens. And so we took these worms and decided to do the same stress. So again, putting them with no food, but instead of looking at behavior, looking at the neuron itself. And so under fed conditions, this is what the DVB neuron looks like. It's very simple in its shape, maybe a few small branches. Uh, but in worms that are stressed and uh, have been off of food, what we saw was that the neuron completely changed its shape adding extensions, uh, what we call neurites, onto uh, its existing shape. Um, and again, these are just pictures of single worms, but we wanted to look in many worms. And so this is just quantification of these pictures. Uh, we can use a software program to, to measure these, uh, the shape of this neuron. And here you can see the stressed worms have uh, longer neurites than the non-stressed worms. Uh, um, as a genetics lab, we really wanted to know what genes control this behavior, uh, this neuronal change to stress. Um, and to keep things simple, we'll keep focusing on the norexin gene. So again, these orange worms lack the norexin gene and protein. And so we asked what happens uh, to the DVB neuron in these worms. So the DVB neuron in worms on food that lack norexin pretty much looks the same. Um, at least at this stage, we can't really see any differences uh, between worms that have, have norexin and those that don't. Um, but when we look at stressed worms, so worms that uh, haven't been on food, uh, what we notice is that the neuron, the DVB neuron, has the same shape essentially as those that were on food. So they're essentially not responding to this stress, uh, at least the DVB neuron isn't. 
And so just to, again, show that we're measuring this in lots of worms instead of just showing you one picture, um, here is the change we saw in worms that have norexin. And in worms that don't have norexin, this is either reduced or almost gone. Um, and so what this means is norexin, uh, similar to how it was required for behavior, norexin is needed for this neuron to change its shape in response to stress. And so what I've shown you so far is that uh, a neuron can change shape um, in response to stress and that this gene norexin is also required. Um, so we kind of wanted to connect, okay, these changes in this neuron to what's actually happening to circuits um, to get us to behavior. And so the first way to look at this is just to look at synapses. And so we essentially did the same experiment, but in this case, instead of just looking at DVB, we wanted to look at what synapses it's making, how many synapses, and where are those synapses? And so uh, here is a picture just showing the red DVB neuron. Hopefully you can see a few green dots. Um, and those are synapses that are in the DVB neuron. Um, to make it easier to see, I'll switch that to, again, black. And so hopefully you see a bunch of black dots. And these are the synapses that DVB is making, again, to neurons that are uh, not, not visible uh, because of the genetic tools we're using. Um, so now what happens to these DVB synapses when we stress the animals? Um, this is showing the DVB neuron, and you can see, as, as we saw before, that it's changed its shape uh, in a few places, although, again, this will be hard to see. Um, and when we switch the colors and look at these black dots that are the DVB synapses, we see that it looked like there were a bunch more um, in, in the stressed worms. And so what we do is, uh, again, we use software that can measure the number of dots, the size of these dots, where these dots are, um, to, quant to measure the DVB synaptic connections. And what we find is that worms that are stressed end up making more connections for their DVB neuron compared to worms that are not stressed. And so this allows us to go just uh, from uh, the impact that the stress had on a single neuron to what might be happening uh, to the synapses of this neuron and ultimately to the circuit. And in work, uh, in work I don't have time to talk about, we've actually done quite a, a bit uh, in this direction. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, we know all of the connections that the neurons in the, in the worm make. Um, and so what we can do is take that information and make a, a diagram of all the connections that the DVB neuron makes to other neurons. And this is just a cartoon version of that where these arrows represent connections uh, between th the DVB neuron and these other neurons. And so we're currently using this to try and dec to decipher where norexin is required, which neurons uh, are, need norexin in order to change the shape of this neuron in response to stress. Um, and essentially trying to figure out how do genes interact with stress to alter uh, neurons? And then um, I also, we've also uh, connected this to behavior. Um, I don't have time to go into this work, but uh, this neuron and this circuit control a, a, a mating behavior in the worm. And uh, what we found is that stress actually modifies this behavior um, due to changes in the circuit and the neuron. And uh, as the short version of the story is that the, this affects mating efficiency in the worms. Um, so just to summarize uh, a little bit about what I've shown you and uh, a lot of what I couldn't show you, uh, we're trying to use the simple nervous system of the worm to understand how stress impacts neurons, circuits, and behavior, and then how these all connect. So what, what changes in this neuron actually ultimately change behavior, and how do they do that? Um, but to answer these questions and connect them, what I've shown you is just a single stress. So uh, as an example, I showed you that worms react to no food um, in different ways, both behaviorally and in their, at the level of neurons. And I showed you one gene, the norexin gene. Um, but in the lab, what we're actually doing is comparing lots of different stressors. So heat shock, uh, exposure to ultraviolet light, uh, we disturb the animal sleep, and test how that affects those same neurons and behaviors. And we're not just looking at norexin, we're actually looking at a lot, a lot of different genes. Here's just a few examples of some genes that are associated with autism that we're currently uh, examining also for roles in these neurons and behaviors and how they, how they may be affected by stress. Um, and so just to summarize sort of the big take home pictures from all of this work, we've you know, found a number of examples where stress uh, can pretty dramatically change neurons and behavior but it's very complicated. So um, it depends on the neuron and the behavior that you're looking at. 
uh, the type and the timing of the stress that you apply. Um, so some neurons respond to no food and others do not. Um, and genes uh, play a huge role in this. Uh, Evan uh, alluded to this quite a bit, but that depending on the genetics that each organism have, uh, as well as us, um, it may modify how susceptible or how we respond to stress. Uh, for example, if you and your friend are studying for a test um, and you go to bed and you can't sleep, but your friend slept perfectly fine, uh, some of that is likely due to genetics and sort of what genes, uh, uh, what sort of genes are in, in your genome um, that allows them to sleep and sort of not care about the stress, but you're sort of wide awake all night. Um, and then lastly, uh, you know, we're trying to study uh, neurons at a, a very detailed level, but ultimately in terms of stress, we want to know uh, how does this, what does this mean for, for humans? Um, and so uh, one way we're doing this is actually working with other labs that use other genetic model organisms that sort of span evolutionary history. So other models, including uh, fruit fly or Drosophila and mice, which uh, we can do lots of different, more complex experiments in um, to understand what genes are doing. And this is actually part of a project that Evan mentioned uh, that's at the School of Medicine, um, the Autism Spectrum Program of Excellence, where uh, all of these labs are collaborating and working together to try and understand uh, norexin and other genes and how they uh, interact to change behavior and what involvement they may have in autism. And the reason this relates to stress is that um, people that are on the autism spectrum often have altered stress response or increased anxiety compared to the general population. And so we're trying to understand, are some of these genes altering the way they respond to stress or causing increased anxiety? And are there ways that we can help reduce that anxiety? So with that, I'd like to thank my terrific lab. Uh, we're relatively new, but we're a small, excited group of scientists. Um, unfortunately, I was only able to show uh, very little of what we're actually doing in the lab. I also want to thank all of the other uh, C. elegans labs at Penn uh, and Penn Medicine. So all of these labs use the worm to ask uh, very many, very different kinds of biologic questions. Um, and Chris Bang Yen and David Raisin have been a huge help in setting up the worm hotel in our lab and doing these behavioral assays. Um, and so with that, uh, I'd like to take any questions. Uh, you can feel free to email me any questions that we don't get to or find me on Twitter. Um, and these are the websites for my lab and the ASPE uh, project. Thank you so much, Dr. Hart, for an excellent talk. Um, we have about a minute for questions, and then we'll go on and bring up Evan to introduce the next speaker. So um, the first question that I think we can ask is, why do the worms become hyperactive when there isn't food? It seems counterintuitive because wouldn't they want to conserve their energy since there is a lack of food? Yeah, so uh, this is looking at eight hours uh, of, you know, when they're exposed to food. So, um, well, we don't really know why they're becoming hyperactive. We sort of assume that if you're not on food and you need food to keep reproducing and laying eggs, um, is that you're going to use that energy to try and find food. So maybe you're on an apple that's, you know, there's no more food. And so you crawl over and if you go sort of a longer distance, you might find an apple that's still rotting and has lots of bacteria. Um, and so we haven't done it, but uh, some groups have looked at what happens if you look at this behavior much longer. And actually, uh, if you keep watching the worms for a few more hours, the, behavior, uh, the activity level does decrease uh, as they decide to then change behavior again um, and uh, start to uh, try and save energy. Thank you. Um, and so Right now we have to transition to our next speaker. Um, and I do wanna quickly point out that one of the questions that we have that has been highly upvoted um, is gonna be uh, what impact that social media had in being a stressor. And we're gonna reserve that question for the panel period that starts at about 7.35. Um, that's also a friendly reminder to everyone that we do have a panel. And so if you guys have more questions, um, burning questions, please stick around for that. So without further ado, Evan, the floor is yours.